The mountains of Oregon are absolutely beautiful, whether in photographs or in person, but mountains can hold deadly secrets. One such secret was found over 50 years ago, and we're just now starting to learn more about it. Let's talk about the body that was, up until recently, the oldest set of unidentified human remains in Oregon. On July 11th, 1963, a man was fishing in the King Creek Reservoir, about 12 miles east of Ashland, Oregon. When he hooked a blanket on his line, he initially thought it was nothing more than that. But when he opened it up, he found a human body. The body was of a boy, just one or two years old at the most. He had been wrapped in the blanket as well as a patchwork quilt. He was fully clothed, dressed in a red long sleeve shirt, gray corduroy pants, a cloth diaper, socks, and shoes. Also found with his body were a sayer's molds wrapped up in the blanket and presumably used to weigh his body down. These molds, as well as telephone wires found with his body, had already fallen out of use by the time he was found. An autopsy conducted the next day determined the boy had been dead since around October of 1962, so less than a year. He was decomposed, and investigators believed he had some sort of developmental disability, possibly Down syndrome. His cause of death couldn't be determined, but his death was investigated as a homicide. Further investigation determined that his clothes were probably from J.C. Penney. His shoes were from Norris Shoes in Medford, about 13 miles north of Ashland. Early investigators thought they might be able to identify the boy through his clothes, and pictures were shared with the public in the hopes that someone might recognize them. Investigators also took prints of his feet and compared them with the footprints of newborns born in local hospitals around the time this boy would have been born. But none of these efforts seemed to lead anywhere. The boy was buried on July 24th of that year, and by October, the case had already gone cold. As Special Investigator Jim Tattersall would later say, There were a lot of other priorities in the country at that time. I hate to say this, but it kind of slipped through the cracks. Over the years, the boy did earn a few nicknames. He's been called King Creek Boy and Ashland Baby Doe, but the name I saw him referred to the most as in my research was The Boy in a Bundle. After the case went cold, the files were archived until it was reopened in 2007. The boy's body was exhumed in 2008, and a DNA sample was obtained from his femur bone. Further testing at that time also determined that his age range was probably a little bit higher than early investigators had thought, closer to between 18 months and two and a half years. In 2009, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a new composite image to show what the boy may have looked like. Then, in December 2020, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office got a tip about the case via Facebook Messenger. It's not publicly known at this point who sent the tip or what it said, but the boy's DNA was sent to Parabon Nanolabs, which is a vertically integrated DNA technology company, according to their website. Later that month, two possible siblings of the boy were located. One of the siblings who lived in Ohio at the time was interviewed by police. He told them about Stevie, his half-brother with Down syndrome, who was born in New Mexico but later moved to Oregon. This man also gave a DNA sample. After this interview, investigators looked into birth certificates of boys named Stevie who had been born in 1960 or 1961. They found one they believed was their doe and confirmed everything through DNA. I assume the DNA of the half-brother. On June 28, 2021, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office announced that the boy in a bundle had been identified as two-year-old Stevie Crawford. Like I mentioned earlier, his remains were the oldest unidentified human remains in Oregon at the time. Now, after 58 years, the public finally knew his real name. Stephen Alexander Crawford was born on October 2nd, 1960 in Las Cruces, New Mexico. By 1962, the man police believe was Stevie's biological father lived in California. 
Around this time, Stevie's mom went on a trip and came home without him. She told her family they wouldn't have to worry about Stevie anymore. As of August 2021, no photos of Stevie have been publicly released. If that changes, I will try to update the pinned comment or the description, so check those places if you're watching this later on. Stevie's mom, stepdad, and the man believed to be his biological father have all since died. His family still lives in New Mexico and plans to get his body moved there to be reburied. By the time you're watching this, that might have already happened. According to several articles published in June and July of 2021, there probably won't be any charges in Stevie's death. Sheriff's officials agree that his death is suspicious because of the way his body was disposed of, but that his death could have been accidental. This case wasn't expected to have charges brought even back in 2009 when Detective Colin Fagan said, we are not interested in prosecuting this case. We have a responsibility to identify the unidentified remains, and that's what this case is all about. So what happened to Stevie Crawford? Unsurprisingly, most people online think he was killed by his mom or stepdad. Some people believe his mom was unwilling or unable to care for a child with Down syndrome, or that it was a mercy killing because he had some sort of health problem she didn't think he would survive. There's also been speculation that his death was accidental and, for whatever reason, covered up. I've also seen a lot of people talking about Stevie's mom's statement to her family that they wouldn't have to worry about Stevie anymore. Just about everyone I've seen speculating about this case says her family probably thought Stevie had been sent to an institution. A lengthy Reddit thread on the case includes several anecdotes from people who said this was common for people with Down syndrome at the time, and that people with disabilities were often dumped in these institutions and essentially forgotten about. I am not an expert on this topic, and we don't know any other details about what happened to Stevie. No family members have come forward to give any more information, and of course we should respect their privacy. So just keep in mind that this is all speculation, but I did want to share it to give you an idea of what might have happened. So it's hard to call this case solved, but it seems like we know all we're going to know for now. If nothing else, I'm glad Stevie was finally identified, and I hope his family is able to rebury him in the state where he was born, if they haven't already. If you found this video interesting or informative, I would love it if you would like and share it. For more true crime videos and other general dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that bell. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.